Welcome to Preparing to Take Off, Reframing the Way We Talk About Family Engagement. For those of you who attended the session this morning, this is a re-recorded version, so you can see all of the videos we intended to share, but weren't able to. A little bit about me. I spent 15 years as the director of the Alabama Parent Information and Resource Center. That was a federally funded project. And I spent years traveling around the state working with Title I schools, helping them to build their capacity to work more effectively in building partnerships with families. When that funding ended, I actually moved to Virginia and took a position at the National PTA, managing all of their family engagement programs. And I was one of the founding board members for NAFSCI at the time. Then I got recruited away to work at Scholastic. I spent four years as staff at Scholastic building their family engagement programs and training schools and school districts across the country about family engagement. Then two years ago, I joined the staff at NAFSCI, um, the National Association for Family, School, and Community Engagement. And in my role at NAFSCI, I'm the Director of Training and Engagement and work with schools and school districts across the country to help them build their capacity to work in partnership with families. I had two beautiful children and the most beautiful car in the world. So let's get started. Everybody knows that family engagement is important. We've actually spent years researching this and the research is all there. Everybody knows that family engagement is a good idea and it's actually even mandated in federal law. But we struggled with the implementation. And at NAFSCI, we wondered why. Why is it that it's so hard to get support and buy-in for family engagement programs and activities. So we turned to the experts to really assess where the field was in terms of family engagement. And we partnered with the Frameworks Institute using funding from the Heising Simons Foundation to really explore that. So I'm gonna let my colleague Marissa from the Frameworks Institute, who is our primary researcher, talk about what that was. In 2016, the Heising Simons Foundation funded the Frameworks Institute to work together with the National Association for Family, School, and Community Engagement to develop a new communications or framing strategy to help people better understand what family, school, and community engagement is, why it's important, and to build support for engagement practices and policies that work. Frameworks has over 20 years of experience helping nonprofits communicate effectively about important social and scientific issues. We've worked on translating the science of early childhood development, created a core story of education that can be used to talk about various aspects of public education, developed tools for talking about out of school STEM learning and early math, in addition to creating framing strategies for topics as diverse as mental health, aging, and climate change. What makes our work different from a lot of communications organizations is that we develop communication strategies that are based on in-depth social science-based research. Most of our staff has PhDs in the social sciences, including anthropology, sociology, political science and linguistics. The framing strategy you're learning about in this curriculum was developed over two years and is the result of intensive research. The primary focus of this research was communicating with members of the public, but it is also informed by experts and advocates in the field of family, school, and community engagement. There were discussions with policymakers, such as state superintendents, and we did do additional research with educators themselves. In the end, over 5,000 participants were part of this research. The result of this multi-year, multi-method research project is a reframing strategy that we call conditions for engagement. It includes seven frames that 
together builds people's understanding of family, school, and community engagement. It helps them recognize why engagement is so important for student success and development. And it builds support for practices and policies that make engagement effective. We also know from our years of experience reframing social issues that creating a research-based communication strategy is critical to moving people's thinking about that issue. But just as important is everyone in a field framing together. Because when people who care about a social issue, who recognize its importance and work on it every day, share that same effective messaging strategy, they can push social change further, faster. And this curriculum will help you join in that endeavor. I wanna say a, a thank you to the National Association for Family, School and Community Engagement for being amazing partners in this work and to the Heising Simons Foundation for making this work possible. So I'm really excited to share with you what we've done with the research from Marissa and her colleagues. And all of that was used to develop the NAFSCI Reframing Family Engagement Academy. The materials we're gonna go over today is from the Academy. And so it gives you a sense of the content. Um, I'll talk more about the Academy once we get to the end. But for now, let's talk about framing. <laughs> framing is really important. And I'm gonna let Dr. Nat Kendall Taylor from the Frameworks Institute talk about why. I have a communications problem. You have a problem of perception. And the problem looks something like this, that you all have been in positions at one time or another where you think you have the most perfect, awesome, slam dunk, whatever sports metaphor you wanna use, way of talking about what you do and why it matters. I mean, heck, it works with two of your closest colleagues. What could go wrong when it goes out to normal people, people who don't eat and breathe and speak your issues all the time. And you find that when this idea that made so much sense to you goes outside of your immediate circle, it does one of two things. So first of all, it lacks resonance. It doesn't have grip. It goes in one ear and out the other. Secondly, probably more unfortunately, because it happens more frequently, I think that thing which worked and was so brilliant in your own head goes out and it has the exact opposite effect on the people you're trying to persuade, on the people you're trying to communicate with. And I'm not gonna ask you to, um, to take my word for anything today, right? I'm gonna show you evidence from the research that I do with my team that shows this. And I have a lot of, of pieces of examples, evidence of this, you say they think, this loss in translation effect. I'm gonna show you one today that comes from some work that we've done to translate the science of early childhood development. And so people who are in, people who are in this field, people who are um, developmental scientists really wanna talk about adversity and stress and the effects that stress and adversity can have on young kids. And they say things like this, that persistent stress can derail development and have negative long-term effects on health and well-being. And if you're a developmental scientist, you replace negative with deleterious because that's the way you talk. And so for folks who are in this field, this is true. There is an incredibly deep body of science across a number of disciplines which supports this point. Unfortunately, when you take this idea out to normal people, to members of the general public, you get things that look and sound like this. Life's hard, it's supposed to be hard. You know, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, the, all the bad cliches you can think of. I mean, there's, there's been people that have come from absolutely nothing to make it in, in whatever society's eyes deem success. So just to make it really crystal clear, that which you just heard was not the intended effect when this expert opened his or her mouth to deliver this message. So you can see why framing is so important by looking at this example. And unfortunately, what frameworks found when they looked at the landscape of how we communicate about family engagement was very similar. Often the messages we send have the opposite effect of what we intend. And that's why we need to reframe the way we talk about family and community engagement. 
So let's talk about family engagement and what that means, because that's part of our challenge. Think about how you explain family engagement. There's no chat box here. So if you want, just pause this slide and write down your response. How do you explain family engagement when somebody asks you what that is? If you pause the slide, just push play when you're ready to go on. This is how the experts explain family engagement. First of all, they say it encompasses all of the ways adults interact in that support children's development, academic achievement, and long-term success, no matter what that looks like. They say family school and community engagement centers on how schools initiate and sustain positive ongoing relationships with both families and community organizations. And they say engagement should be relational, intentional, goal-oriented, and continuous. They also believe it must involve recognition of the positive contributions of everybody involved in children's lives, and it must be responsive to cultural differences. So ask yourself, do you think this is how people in your community currently explain family and community engagement? In most communities, it is not. So what are some of the strategies that might foster that type of family engagement? Again, feel free to pause this recording and take a minute and write your response down. What are some of the strategies you think might foster family engagement in meaningful ways? When you're ready to continue, just push play to move on. Here are some strategies that the experts believe foster family engagement. We know that engagement has to be age appropriate and developmentally sensitive. Not everything is gonna work for every family. Also, the earlier it starts, the better. We should be initiating engagement during early childhood. And we should initiate engagement early in the school year. While families are getting to know the school and the teachers, it's an opportunity to really build and sustain that engagement over the course of the year. And ensure that communication between schools and families is consistent, that it's proactive, that it's responsive and inclusive throughout the year. We should also create community asset maps. Often, one or two people might know about some assets that are available to families in the community, but if families don't get to meet those teachers or social workers or family engagement experts, they never find out about those assets themselves. So having a community asset map allows all of the people in your school to know about the resources that are available to families so they can share those with families when families have needs and partner with community organizations to coordinate in school and out of school learning. Kids don't shut off their learning valve when they walk out of the school at the end of the day. And the more you can coordinate in school and out of school learning activities, the better the outcomes for students. Which of these strategies do you think would have the biggest impact in your community and why? Feel free to take a minute, and write your ideas down. If you'd like, push pause on this recording and then push play when you're ready to continue. Now let's think about policies that could foster family engagement. This is a big challenge because we often don't think about policy when it comes to family engagement. So if you like, pause this recording, jot down a few ideas of policies you think might foster effective family engagement and then push play when you're ready to continue. These are the policies that experts say will foster family engagement in meaningful ways. First of all, include training in teacher prep and professional development programs. Often family engagement is not a source of training and most educators haven't had any kind of formal training on how to engage families before they enter the classroom. So providing that as a policy ensures that it gets done. 
Also, make practitioner home visits standard for all families. We know from the research that positive relationship building home visits has tremendously positive effects on student academic and social outcomes. Incorporate requirements for engagement into school improvement plans. So make sure that when schools are writing their school improvement plans, they're thinking about how are they going to communicate their school improvement goals to families? What do they want families to do to help them meet that goal? And then how are they gonna educate families about those strategies? Also think about establishing community schools. Community schools form a hub and offer lots of opportunities for families to connect with other community partners. Create state level engagement frameworks. And in Maryland, you are almost there. Your state level engagement frameworks are just about ready to be relaunched. Which of these policies do you think would have the biggest impact in your community and why? Think about it. Feel free to pause the slide, jot your notes down and then push play when you're ready to continue. Now let's talk about cultural models. Cultural models are shortcuts for our brains. They're shared but implicit understandings and assumptions that help us to think faster. One of the challenges with cultural models is they're out there everywhere. And lots of people have the same cultural models that get triggered in their minds. Also, some of those cultural models can be used together in multiple ways at multiple times. And we have to find ways to navigate around the ones that prevent people from thinking about our issue in productive ways. Here's a video from communications expert, Sean Adamack, explaining a little bit more about cultural models. As humans, we use shortcuts that our brains have created to make sense of the world. A friend tells you they went camping for the weekend and your brain immediately conjures up not just images and ideas related to the camping, but also beliefs and values about the campers. You won't even know you're doing it, but it's actually a critical element to engaging with each other as humans. The same thing happens when we're exposed to social issues. If you're engaged in a conversation about education, your brain accesses the shortcuts that it's created related to the concept of education, the people involved, and all of the issues related to that subject. These patterns can be helpful or they can be disruptive and very difficult to break through. Our goal is to give audiences a new way of thinking about family engagement. This is important because based on our research, the way people currently think about family engagement actually prevents them from understanding it. There are lots of ways to sway public opinion or even to get members of the public to support a certain policy. The goal of strategic framing is much bigger than that. For family engagement to be universally adopted and embraced, we need to change the way we talk about it. Together, over time, we can shift the way the public, policymakers, and even educators think and talk about family engagement. So these were some of the cultural models that were identified in the research that was done by the Frameworks Institute. The cultural models you see in the green box, those are cultural models that work really well, that lots of people hold, and we can piggyback on to communicate about family engagement in ways that trigger more productive thinking. For example, most people agree that parents should be actively engaged in their children's education. They also agree that engagement should start when children are young, and schools should be welcoming environments that welcome all families into their children's learning. They also agree when families are engaged, students have better outcomes. One of the ones we need to be cautious with is the schools are families cultural model. This is a model that's held primarily by practitioners. And then the ones we need to be wary of are the tangible triad, the care transference or caring is everything, traditional engagement, and the culture of poverty cultural models. 
Um, in our Reframing Academy, we go through each of these, but let's just talk about them in general now. Shared cultural models, such as the ones you just saw in the green box, mean that the public practitioners and policymakers all share them. So we can use those to build a stronger case for our policies and practices that foster family engagement. The one that is held by practitioners is the schools or families cultural model. They often believe that schools are families and they use that language when they talk about the school where students are nurtured and cared for in the same way families and parents care for their own children. This model can promote partnerships with families, but it doesn't by itself lead to systemic thinking. So you really need to make a compelling case about why this should happen through policies rather than informally. If you don't, you risk people falling into the care transference or caring is everything cultural model. So now there are several cultural models that also prevent the public, the practitioners, and the policymakers from thinking about family engagement the way we want them to in productive ways. And those are the ones we must avoid. Let's take a look at the caring is everything cultural model. In our academy, we go through each of the cultural models that were identified today, but today we're just gonna focus on caring is everything. So according to this cultural model, caring about a child is really the only thing that matters when it comes to making a good parent, a good teacher, or an engaged community member. It's all about how much you care. This cultural model sees engagement between schools and families as the expression of, or the transfer of, care between teachers, parents, and students. They all care for each other. Now, in the next video, listen to the responses to the questions about family engagement and see if you can hear the caring is everything cultural model at work. Loving teachers. Have love in their heart. Being loved and cared for. Parents taking more interest in their children. This encouraging of the uh, education. So like if your parents don't care, then you probably won't care that much either. So you see how caring is sort of dangerous when we think about family and community engagement. We don't fall, want to fall into the trap where we think caring is the only thing Loving. that matters. The problem is it helps people um, see the importance of having good, strong relationships between parents and teachers, but it focuses on individual parents and teachers and it, their character and motivation. That makes it really hard for people to see how relationships between parents and teachers can be intentionally fostered with good programs or interventions. It also hides the need for the formal programs that facilitate engagement and it makes systemic thinking difficult. When we highlight those parent-teacher relationships, it leaves out other educators and community members as contributors to a child's success. They're not even a part of the equation when we fall into the caring is everything cultural model. This makes it easy for people to believe that parents and teachers who don't engage must not care. And that's dangerous thinking. Here are the pro tips to avoid the caring is everything cultural model. Never, ever, 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 ever focus on parents or teachers level of caring. In fact, if you're smart, just try and avoid the use of the word care at all. Talking about whether or not people care or how much they care cues that caring is everything cultural model. And that undermines the idea that policies and programs can effectively promote engagement. No, we should also avoid suggesting that some people don't care as much as we avoid talking about how much people do care because they both reinforce the assumption that people who aren't there or aren't engaged don't care and that's false. Here are some of the main findings from the research that was done by the Frameworks Institute. 
First of all, the public's understanding of family engagement is very narrow. They often see it and they think it's just back to school night or parent teacher conferences or PTA meetings, and they don't see anything beyond that. They often don't recognize the role that institutions play in family engagement. Schools and local school governing agencies like school boards create policies and programs that can make engagement more likely to happen. And the research found that most people don't recognize that at all. They also didn't um, make the connection between equity and family engagement. It was very unclear to them. They didn't understand how current engagement practices might be inequitable for many families and how family engagement can actually be a really useful and important tool to advance equity in the community. They cannot see the broader impacts of engagement. Many of them think that this is something that just makes parents and teachers lives harder, and they don't see how that benefits teachers or families. So when they did the research, the Frameworks Institute identified three conditions for engagement that make it possible for meaningful engagement to occur. There are three strands that make up the conditions for engagement. The first strand is to orient your communications toward equity. This can be done when you join an inclusive vision of opportunity with a grounded diagnosis of current inequities. Second, explain the role of context. Show how institutional factors, those formal programs and policies, can either prevent or promote engagement. And finally, illustrate the transformative power of engagement. Help people see the scope and depth of benefits of engagement and how it transforms the education system and communities. These three strands animate the reframing strategy and run through specific recommendations. By consistently pointing to the conditions necessary for family, school, and community partnerships, we can broaden our understanding of what engagement involves and help people recognize the importance of policy in better supporting it. By demonstrating how standard practices make engagement difficult, if not impossible, for many families, we can orient people towards equity and help people see what kinds of programs and policies are necessary. Clearly showing how equitable engagement can improve outcomes for everyone in a community builds support for robust changes to the educational system. Each of these conditions for engagement makes a difference on its own, but woven together, they become a powerful and comprehensive framing strategy that centers engagement as a critical component of child development and student success. So let's take a closer look at each of these conditions for engagement. First up, orient towards equity. Remember, most people have no idea what equity means when we talk about it in the context of family and community engagement. So we have to share with them the ways that our usual family engagement practices often exclude low-income families, families of color, non-English speaking families, and many, many others. At the same time, we should be painting for them a picture about what a more equitable engagement looks like and how we can achieve it. When it comes to explaining the role of context, most people don't understand that either. We have to counter personalized understandings of family engagement where people see that as individual responsibility and really build the support for things like policy change. So to do that, we have to show how the conditions shape engagement. In other words, how institutional factors like school policies can either prevent or promote engagement. And finally, it's important to illustrate the transformative power of engagement. Remember, 
Most people have no idea the positive effects that engagement can have on the community, on educators, and on families themselves. So we have to explain how ongoing and regular family and community engagement transforms the educational system as well as the community. If we help them see the scope and depth of the benefits of engagement, then they recognize that it needs to be prioritized consistently. These are the six framing recommendations that the Frameworks Institute developed when they conducted the research with NAFSCI. So we're going to take a look at each one of these six recommendations. In the Reframing Family Engagement Academy, you will find that there's a module that focuses on each one of these specifically. So let's start with Opportunity for All. Opportunity for All builds on people's deeply held idea that high quality educational opportunities should be available for all children and in all communities and positions engagement as an important educational opportunity. It simultaneously shows that opportunities for engagement promote student learning, thereby positioning engagement as a means to ensure more equitable outcomes. Results from the experiment suggest that the value helps people see that making opportunities for engagement available is a policy matter rather than one of low individual motivation or the deficient cultural values of certain groups. The opportunity for all value brings to the surface an aspirational vision of more equitable access to engagement and also demonstrates its transformative power. The second one is to always provide concrete examples of equity. Most people have no idea what we mean when we talk about equity. So let's watch a video where you can see that in action. So the first is equity. I'm wondering if, if, if you all have heard that term before um, and might have some thoughts about what it might mean. So it's kind of like home equity? Some sort of loan. You, have, you bought your house for, say, 200, 250, and you know, some years later, it's worth 400. You know, that gap there is equity. Equity in a life insurance policy, what you built towards something, in my opinion, is equity. Equity is kind of like basically how much leverage you have. So like you own a business or something, how much money like your business is worth. Are you talking about money, the equal money equality? And if you think of um, equity in relation to race, what would be your guess of what it might mean? Like racial equality, same thing? So is it equity equality? In the sense that I get is that when people are saying equity, they mean something more specific than when they're saying equality, but I definitely have not seen it explained. Providing everybody with the same opportunities to be able to be successful, no matter like what level they're on. I have not heard it mentioned as far as people. I mean, normally you hear of equity in your home. Especially if you're poor and if you're black, you know, a lot of us, we just, we like a couple generations removed from like slavery. So a lot of us are still trying to build from that gap and trying to uh, get to that level where we have equity and stuff to leverage. People have been saying racial equality forever. Why is it changing to equity now? Who's saying equity? So you can see there's a lot of confusion out there. We take it for granted when we talk about the need for equity when it comes to education, but when we send those messages out and we don't define it, people define it for themselves. And they're often defining these things in ways we don't intend. So the first is People don't understand equity. It's important for us to spell it out so they know exactly what we're talking about. We have to share with everyone how typical engagement practices often keep people from participating in events or activities or anything else we do with their children. And often those are low-income families, families of color, non-English speaking families, and sometimes others. So we have to share with them 
a picture of what more equitable engagement might look like and how we can achieve it. But that alone is not enough. People need also to see examples of the current inequities present in family engagement. For example, you might be in a school that has materials that are only distributed in English or sometimes in English and Spanish, but you have a lot of families that speak languages other than that. So concrete solutions like translating those materials into all of the languages your family speak will really help them understand that concept. Without that translation, many families are unable to access the materials that we're sharing about how they can support their children's learning. Experts say that our current engagement practices aren't equitable because we don't address those linguistic, cultural, and socioeconomic barriers that could prevent engagement for some. So we should emphasize the need for the specific practices that address those barriers so all families and communities can be engaged. If we do that, it can be a huge tool to help us advance equity and even ultimately close that achievement gap. But members of the public often assume that um, the reason other families aren't engaged is because of their culture and not because we don't have inclusive engagement practices in our school. Most people think that when they think about low income families and whether or not they engage, they think it's a product of that culture of poverty that devalues education. We know all families love their children and want the best for them. So it's important for us to make sure that we differentiate. Engagement is the result of systemic challenges and not individual or cultural differences. Because if we don't, it becomes way too easy for people to assume that some of those families could never be reached. When you combine values, you increase their power. And the values of opportunity for all and equity in particular pair nicely and offer a really nice way for you to promote that the opportunity for all is why we're here and the equitable practices that have been missing in the past are the reason why we're not where we need to be yet. Next up is interdependence. Interdependence helps practitioners and educators see family engagement in a broader context. So they can see family engagement as something that's much more feasible. It's not just their responsibility or they aren't the only ones who can put engagement practices into place. They begin to see this as something that the system has to help support. It diverts their thinking away from assuming that engagement is just another unrealistic demand on their time. Here's an example of a message that promotes the interdependence value. Every child deserves a high quality education. That's why it's important that we all work together to ensure they have every opportunity to succeed. This was just a simple tweet that was sent um, that promoted the value of interdependence. There are a lot of ways you can help educators and practitioners realize that it's not just them alone, that the system has a responsibility to create the pathways to partnership so we can all work together in meaningful ways. Here's how interdependence works. Interdependence helps practitioners understand the parent-teacher relationship within a broader context. That helps practitioners see family engagement as feasible. Reasoning with this value, practitioners understand that the burden of engagement doesn't fall solely on teachers and that effective engagement practices distribute that responsibility. Interdependence diverted practitioners away from thinking their engagement is just another unrealistic demand on their time, and that prevents some pushback. The interdependence value pushes practitioners to prioritize steps schools can take to enable family and community engagement. That provides an important thread of the larger conditions of engagement frame, namely that certain kinds of institutional contexts 
make engagement more or less likely to occur. So the space launch metaphor is an explanatory metaphor, which is different from a literary metaphor and is something that the Frameworks Institute has found really helps people expand their thinking so they become more understanding of and supportive of particular issues. When they conducted the research for NAFSKI, they tested the space launch metaphor along with a cooking metaphor and an infrastructure metaphor. Let's hear from Marissa about what they found. In the case of family, school, and community engagement, the explanatory metaphor that we found works extremely well is space launch. Communicating with the space launch metaphor means talking about engagement as launching student success. This metaphor is one of the most successful we have ever tested across the board. Both members of the public and educators could understand and use the language of this metaphor when talking about engagement and even drew pictures of rockets when we were testing it in person. This metaphor is what we call a rich domain because there's so many aspects of it that can be compared to engagement. For instance, in order to launch a rocket, you need strong ongoing collaboration between various groups of experts such as engineers, physicists, and the ground crew. Similarly, student success entails bringing together the expertise of educators, families, and community members in ongoing partnerships. The members of Mission Control also need to come together well before the launch, putting together detailed plans and troubleshooting. Similarly, educators and families need to engage early on before the school year and even in early childhood to plan for the future. In the case of families, so here's a video that shows what an impact the space launch metaphor can have. First, we'll watch a video of a man on the street being asked about family and community engagement. Then the researcher read the metaphor to him and we'll hear what his response was. Let's start with the first interview. So as far as schools and families working together, what would you say that that looks like? Uh, I mean, there's only so much one can do. I mean, there's so many families that you would have to work with, and that would be a massive overhaul. How would you say schools and communities work together? I don't know how I would like have communities and schools directly interact, but maybe there should be something there? I'm not sure. So now let's take a look at what he said after the researcher read the space launch metaphor to him. So I'm curious what you took away from that. Boom. That, that's it. I mean, that's what I've been saying. Everything's connected. Um, if we all work together, everybody wins. As if we all help each other out. We pull each other's bootstraps. How would you say that affects children's learning? I would say it would be a very healthy relationship because, for one, it's everybody's pooling their resources to fuel our future, our children and our future. And, but at the same time, it shows kids that, hey, if we work together, we can get stuff done. We can, we can make this world just a little bit better every day. Isn't that great? We love to see people really latch on to the metaphor and think about family engagement in a more productive way. Let's take a look at a couple more examples of how the space launch metaphor changes the way people think about family engagement. When you think about children learning, how does that happen? Um, definitely through, I guess, organized schooling and starts with teachers. Thinking about schools working together with families, uh, what comes to mind when you think about them? Um, PTA meetings, um, teacher conferences, parent-teacher conferences, and stuff like that. Um, so thinking about that idea that I read, uh, how should they be working together? What should it look like? So that just like a rocket launch goes together, you can't have a rocket launch without your scientists and your mathematicians and people driving the rocket and all that stuff and that's the same thing that goes with the schools and the community like without everybody working together it's not going to work and if you have the community and the school and parents all working together knowing where they're going then shouldn't fail 
it's so great that in that um, video, he starts to map on other elements of a space launch in his own mind. He's making those connections. Let's look at another example. This one's my favorite. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about like what that kind of engagement, families and schools, what that should look like? Hmm. Wow. Uh, no. <laughs> I wouldn't know tell you where to begin on that one. But going back to maybe schools, families, and communities, how should they be working together? I guess there should be a mission control that kind of connects them as an inner working of nerves, central hub to like process all the information and projects. Isn't that great? Like they come up with these things on their own and they start to really think about everybody having a role to play to make sure that our students are successful. Um, we just love the yeah, space do you have any thoughts about what? The next recommended um, frame or value is foregrounding benefits. This is emphasizing the benefits for teachers and students to increase the salience of the issue or how people perceive the importance of the issue. It deepens their understanding of the way that engagement works and it builds support for policies to promote engagement. Unfortunately, most people seem very familiar with benefits to students, but not as familiar with benefits to teachers. When we frame engagement by highlighting the ways that it benefits teachers and students, we can increase support for equitable engagement practices. The study that the Frameworks Institute did found that framing engagement in those terms um, was much more effective than framing engagement in terms of the benefit to parents and caregivers, which was less effective unless the message was to parents and caregivers, in which case they did see a really positive effect. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, this is the uh, research chart that Frameworks put together um, that really shows the effects of those benefits messages. And you'll notice for student benefits and for teacher benefits, there's a pretty significant increase. Um, the parent benefits or family and caregiver, caregiver benefits are lower and really ineffective when it comes to collective efficacy. That's why we also recommend using parents to message other parents. Parents are their own best advocates. So if you can help parents and care caregivers to communicate about the benefits of family engagement, when you're trying to send a message to other parents and caregivers, you'll go much farther. Um, that being said, when they share messages about family engagement, those messages really should emphasize those conditions for engagement. Their messages should be oriented towards equity. They should explain the role of context, meaning the school's policies and procedures, and they should illustrate the transformative power of engagement by talking about the transformation that it's made in their lives or the lives of their own children. Here's a video from Marissa talking about those benefits. Something that you may have noticed in this graph is that when we tested the benefits messages alone, benefits for parents didn't really do anything to move people's support. So we decided to see what happened when you tested it a slightly different way. As you can see in this graph, when you use parents themselves to talk about benefits to them, it is much more successful. This is great news for your communications. Parents really are their own best advocates. And it's important to take advantage of that fact when you're talking about how families benefit from engagement. Yes, it's really important if you want families to understand the benefit that they're gonna have that you use families to communicate that message to them. Something that you may have. While focusing on the benefit of engagement for teachers and students is a highly effective strategy, focusing on parents actually requires careful framing. When we talk about the benefit of engagement for parents, 
we need to be sure to feature parents as the messenger. People have a difficult time understanding how engagement will benefit parents. When parents explain the benefits of engagement, the message becomes more believable. And when parents detail their own experiences, it helps people see that engagement is achievable. When we can bring parental benefits into view, we can further advance the idea that engagement is transformative for everybody involved. As we recruit and mobilize parents to support and advocate for engagement in all communities, we should simultaneously equip parents to become visible spokespeople for the movement. It's important that parents situate their experiences within the larger conditions of engagement frame. That means they need to detail how institutions make engagement possible, focus on equity, and explain how engagement results in better outcomes for everyone. So the content that you saw today is actually content that came right out of the Virtual Reframing Academy. The NAFSKI Reframing Family Engagement Academy consists of 10 modules. There are an hour and a half of videos within those modules, and there's a course journal that accompanies the modules that has practice assignments for each one. During the academy, Participants have the opportunity to take some practice exams, and then there are 10 exams at the end, one at the end of each module. If they get over 80% on each of the exams, they have the opportunity to earn a NAFSKI certificate of completion. On the screen, you will see the address for the NAFSKI Reframing Academy. Um, Anybody who is a member of NAFSKI can access the Academy at no cost. It's completely free to NAFSKI members. For people who are not members of NAFSKI, the cost to access the Academy is $100. If you need more information about how to access the Academy or reframing in general, um, please feel free to reach out to me, Sherry Wilson, here is my phone number and my email address. I'm happy to talk to you about family engagement or reframing or anything else you like. Thank you and have a wonderful day.